Hello? This is much better. Okay, uh, so uh, I've been giving this talk for a while, and that is essentially because I got a little tired of hearing that search is hard and that we need to, we need to make it easier. And I, I'm always baffled by that because I think it is f actually fairly easy, and it is my goal today to actually convince you of that. So first we need to, as any good scientist or engineer, we need to first define the problem. What is actually search? Well, search is whenever you have a pile of data and you're looking for something. In our case, we're looking for text. We're looking for full text. So how would you, how would you do, go about it if you want to find the book that mentions Django? So when you find a book that's uh, that's easy. You just go to your library and you read all the books that there are there and set aside all those that mention Django. When you want to search uh, for Django in a bunch of files, that's again super easy. Just, just grep it. And grep will do the work for you. It will go to all the files on your disk and it will search them for the word Django and put them aside. If you want to search for uh, the Django models in your database for Word Django, again, super simple. Just do a query set with uh, I contains, and Django will do that for you. It will go to the database. It will read every single uh, model in that table, read all the data, and look for Django in there. So obviously, this is not a way to go. It doesn't scale, and more importantly, it doesn't really work. Uh, because imagine that you have the word slightly misspelled or you have it in different form. So uh, instead, of, instead of Jungle Knot, you have Django or something like that. And it just really isn't, isn't working. And search is trying to solve this. And it's not a new problem. And it has been solved for quite some time now. And the solution you're all very familiar with, I hope. Because if you've ever read a book, usually there is an index at the end which uh, points you to all the important concepts or places or names in the book and the list of pages. And that is what we call an inverted index. That is a data structure that we use today. It was first created in, in 1230 and we are still using it to this day to power search. Except now, instead of, instead of paper and things, we use computers. But the theory is the same. And the theory is this. You have a list of words on the left side that are sorted. And for each of those words, you have a list of documents, files, pages that actually contain this word, which are also sorted. The sorting part is important uh, because what, then when you do a search, so you're looking for uh, Python, uh, Django, and Python. So all you have to do is locate those two words in the sorted dictionary, and you get back two lists that are sorted. And your task is to actually uh, go through those two lists and output anything that appears in both. This could actually solve as an, uh, uh, serve as an interview question, code this on a whiteboard. It's actually not hard. And it is actually not that expensive. And it has other nice qualities. For example, uh, those lists, they don't have to come from the same index. You can use multiple indices uh, at the same time. If you have more than one field in your document, you can very easily use all the indices for all the fields. You get these lists it's called a posting list. Uh, you get these posting lists from all the different indices and you just merge them together. If you want to do an OR query, Python or Django, then you just output everything, not just the uh, documents that are in all of the lists, but all the documents that you find. And uh, that makes it very, very efficient. You're just walking through sorted lists and merging them together. So the only problem remains, how do you build this? And that is actually where all the magic happens, where, when you're building uh, the inverted index. This process is called text analysis. 
And this is an example of how it could look. So you have a, you have a sentence which I, which I took for, uh, from, from an unnamed website. And you have, you have the output, the words that I consider important in the form that they are most, most useful to me. And you can immediately notice several things. First of all, everything is lowercase. That makes sense if I want to search for a web and I input in lowercase or uppercase, I should still find this sentence. I should still find this document. Uh, also, I skipped some words. I don't care to find the word is or a. Assuming that we are working with English, uh, those words will be pretty much in every single document that we have. That's not interesting. Like That will not help us at all, and it will just take up space in the index. Those are called stop words, and we just ignore them. Uh, also, what I did was, in some cases, like here, rapid and fast, those are synonyms. Those are the same words. So if somebody uh, is looking for a framework that allows them to develop fast, they should also find this document. It's not their fault that uh, the creators of Django have larger vocabulary, so you actually have to use rapid instead of fast. You should not be penalized for, for Adrian's uh, journalistic education. So, and also, one last thing, you notice that some of the words are mangled. We don't have encourages or uh, or development. We just find the root of the word, the stem. So all this process is designed to do one thing, to essentially normalize the input. And when we, uh, when we apply this process to both the text and then the query, we can then do the matching. So this is the, uh, the core idea behind uh, full text search, the text analysis. And it all happens at index time. That, that is, we have prepaid all this cost. So once it is in the index, it's already there, already done, and we can, we can do uh, searches very efficiently. And there is one last thing that actually uh, is different for full text search compared to normal querying in your, in your regular uh, database. And that is, we can tell you not only if a document matched the query, but how well did it match? For example, if you're looking for a book uh, mentioning Django, if you use the, the model approach, the query set, you will get uh, all the books that have Django anywhere in them. For example, you have a book on Flask that mentions in one chapter, hey, this is not Django. And it will be in the output with the s indistinguishable from, from the two scoops of Django book which is actually much more relevant. So that is one last reason why you should never ever use query sets to actually power search. So I've, I've told you what not to do. Let's move on to what, uh, what you can do. So I work for Elastic, so I'm biased. I'll be talking about Elasticsearch. And what Elasticsearch is, it is a database. It is a data store. Uh, that you can use to put your data into it, it's distributed, and most importantly, it's document-oriented. And by documents, I mean literally anything that you can express as JSON. So no matter how complex the structure, if you can express it as JSON, you can index it into Elasticsearch, and Elasticsearch can, uh, can use it. We are not schemaless, as, as some people claim, but what we do is we have dynamic schema. So you don't have to define the schema beforehand. If we find a field in your document that you haven't told us about, we will just, we'll just make up the schema. We'll look at the value and we'll see, hey, this is a string. From henceforth, it should be known as string. There's only one exception to this. If the string looks like it could be a date, we will say that it is a date. That is, of course, because JSON has no uh, first class support uh, for date times. We also actually support some relationships between, uh, between documents, uh, one-to-many relationships, uh, but we'll not go into those uh, today. So how do you actually use it? This is, how, this is a very simple example from, from Python. And you can just create a connection, index a document into it, and then run a search, and you get the results. 
And this works, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's not very, not very convenient, especially writing the queries, which you, can see, uh, which you can see are also JSON or Python dictionaries in this case, can get really hard and really messy really quickly. So what we, uh, what we did instead, we created a, a nicer looking DSL for this. So in this example, we are creating a doc type, which is essentially something like a model, which allows us to create the schema. So we have a book that has a one field called title, which, has the, which uses the English analyzer. Then we index a document, and then we can actually search. And what we get back is, is the result. So that is all that you have to do. Well, this is a, for a very basic search. Because if you actually look at, uh, look at some search uh, that, you, uh, that you can find out there, there is more to it than just than just the middle. Because what we just did is we implemented uh, just the middle part of the search, just to get, get, me, the, uh, uh, get me the links. But there are other things that actually come into the search. Because this part is super useful and super good if you know what you're looking for. If you know that you're looking for Django. But if you don't know what you're looking for, it's not really useful at all. You would have to try all the possible combinations. And that's why we have facets. Those are the, the things on the left, which gives you sort of an overview of your data. So when we search for the, uh, the letters DJA, we can immediately see that 90% of the results are, are actually written in Python. And we can see the number of results for Python and for JavaScript and for all the other languages. So immediately we see, we just take one look at this, and we see that it has a connection to Python, and most of it uh, is in Python. You can also see that it found uh, several thousand repositories, some results in code, some results uh, in issues, et, uh, et cetera. So again, you can see uh, sort of the distribution of the results across your data. So that is very good for exploration. So how does, this, how does this actually work? In Elasticsearch case, it's powered by aggregations. And aggregations, when you think about it in a general case, it's just separating your data into groups. We just call them buckets. And then performing some calculation in, for each group. In SQL, that's group by, and then you have the aggregate functions like max, uh, sum, count, et cetera. In uh, Elasticsearch, it's buckets and metrics. There is, however, one important difference uh, in how we do aggregations or what we allow you to do with aggregations compared to, for example, SQL. We allow you to nest those aggregations. So you can uh, d uh, separate your documents by, uh, by type. You put all the books together, all the magazines together, all the blog articles together. And then within that, you can uh, further distribute them, for example, by month. So you can have a bucket per month per uh, type. And you can nest these, so you can do multi-dimensional aggregations and all in the one pass, all in a single query. You're also not limited to a single aggregation in a query. So you can, in the same query, you can ask to for distribution per type, per tag, and per month, and get all of these, all of these results together. So uh, we have different types of aggregations. Uh, the most commonly used one is, our, is terms aggregation, which puts all the documents that have uh, the same value of a field together. So uh, if you have a category field or tags or something like that, that's what you want. Know that uh, all the fields in Elasticsearch can actually have multiple values uh, you're not limited to a single value. You can uh, just as well assign a string or a list of strings. Elasticsearch doesn't care. So if you have tags or category, you can have multiple tags, which means that the document will end up in multiple buckets. There is an interesting aggregation called significant terms, which uses the fact that we know about the data. We are, we are the search guys. We know what words are common, which are rare, and what is the distribution of the words across your data set. So if you give us a bucket, we can tell you what's specific for this bucket, what is significant. 
uh, compared to the background, compared to, the, uh, compared to your other data. So for example, if you do an aggregation per month, a date histogram, and then within that you ask for the significant terms on, on hashtags, you get trending. You get the hashtags that are more significant for this time period compared to all the others. Those are not the most popular, but the most significant. And for metrics, there are some, there are some boring things like stats, which will give you for numeric fields all the averages and sum of all squares and everything to, uh, to uh, make even the scientific people next door happy. So this, these, are, these are aggregations. This is the theory, and this is how it actually looks in the query DSL. So we already saw how to create the search request, and now we just add an aggregation. So we add a date histogram aggregation, and then we add another aggregation, which is a terms histogram, uh, sorry, terms ag uh, aggregation over the field tags. And within that, we also look for, uh, for the stats on the read count. So very simple way to actually specify those aggregations, and you get back the, uh, the results in a single go. So when we look at our, uh, our search uh, interface where we want to get to, uh, that's, that's the faceting part. That's the part on the left. Uh, and it is very useful interface to navigate. If you've ever searched for a hotel or if you ever searched for a product on Amazon, you should be, you should be familiar with how useful this is. If you look for a hotel in Brisbane, and on the left side you can immediately see how many five-star hotels there are, how many four-star hotels, what, is, what are the price ranges, and you can immediately see and, and go there and just click on it and in the background someone will uh, do a query to Elasticsearch and just add a filter to it to reflect the, the choice that you've, you've clicked on. By the way, there is no coincidence that I'm using GitHub as an example. They actually do use Elasticsearch for all their searches. Unfortunately, not Python, but hey, nobody's perfect. So that's, that's sort of the, the search part and then the exploration part. But as we can see, there are more things going on here. Uh, and the important thing that we also see here is the highlighting. We can see which parts of the repository name or something actually matches our query. So we can do highlighting. And some people don't really understand why that's such a, such a good feature or why I cannot just do it in, in JavaScript when everything is rendered. But it is actually a fairly complex problem because of the text analysis. For example, if you search for a framework for fast web development, we will actually highlight the word rapid for you. We will actually know that, yes, you search for fast, but that actually matched uh, the word that is seventh in that sentence, and we will highlight it for you. So that is, uh, that is why you sort of need to delegate this to Elasticsearch, and it would be non-trivial to do it on your own. You would essentially have to replicate all the logic that uh, Elasticsearch has regarding text analysis and the actual full text search. Uh, so it is very useful also if you have a, a long text, if you actually allow uh, people to search in the uh, body of a book, and then you just want to show them the fragments, the individual uh, passages from, uh, from the book that actually matched. So, uh, that is uh, why you would also use highlighting, to not to have to tr uh, transfer all of, the, all of the book, but only the relevant parts, and also to display it. So again, how do you, how do you use this? It's super simple, once you have the search, you just call the highlight method on it, and you give it a list of fields that you actually want to highlight on, and maybe some options. Those are optional. So again, Super, super simple things, and we're pretty much done with, with our search. So we know how to, how to run the search, how to do the, do the facets, uh, how to do highlighting. So now uh, to the more practical part, let's, let's put this all together. We are here at DjangoCon, so let's assume that you have a Django application that you want to add search to. So the first thing that you do is you define your document types. Uh, in this case, we have, we have a book that has three fields. 
It can have many other fields. I am just defining the fields that I care about, that I care about defining. Uh, but it is still, if I index something that has more fields, Elasticsearch will just take a look at it, create a schema, a mapping for it, and, and index it. So you don't have to map all the fields. Here I'm mapping the, the field title. I'm saying that it's in English. But because I want to search, uh, I want to sort on it. I also instruct Elasticsearch to keep the uh, not analyzed version, sort of the raw version. Because once we mangle it with the text analysis, it's very uh, useless for sorting. Because we've, we've dropped a bunch of words, words that usually actually occur at the beginning of the title, like the. So we've also lowercased everything, and we might have chopped something from the beginning of a word. And also, we've split things into words. And you don't want to sort on individual words. That makes no sense. You need to sort on the whole thing. So that's why we are keeping the raw uh, version of, of the title. Then we have a simple date, and we have uh, nested uh, documents called editions. So a book has editions from different publishers, published at different date. And in this uh, line, we're essentially telling Elasticsearch that there will be a list of documents that do belong to the book, but they can be searched on their own. And they are actually their own separate tiny documents that are an integral part of the book, but we can, for example, aggregate over just the editions. So we can search for books and then aggregate on their editions. So uh, very useful, uh, very useful thing. So this is what we do for the doc type. Then when you have, when you have models, uh, you want to synchronize them. Of course, nobody is forcing you to. You can just use the document types and, and just, use, uh, just use Elasticsearch. Uh, many people do, though we don't officially recommend that you actually use Elasticsearch as a uh, uh, primary data store. So in this case, we have, we have a book model. And what I found uh, works the best is to just define a method. I typically call it to search. That will actually return uh, the, uh, the doc type, the instance of the doc type. So you can see that to instantiate it, I just import search, do search.book, pass it the title, pass it the editions. You can see that I also use the to search to sort of serialize all the related models. And that is very important because you represent data differently in your relational database and in Elasticsearch. Relational databases are relation oriented. They store rows, relations. Uh, whereas Elasticsearch stores documents, and there is different way how to look at data. Uh, there is, however, one trick that I can highly recommend. Make sure that the document and the model has the same shape. What I mean by shape is that it has a similar interface. For example, uh, you see here that I have created the property additions. And actually, when you iterate over book.editions, you will get back the individual editions. And you will get the same behavior from the model and from the doc type. The only difference is the doc type will be much more efficient because it already has the documents contained within it. Uh, whereas if you were to uh, iterate over, uh, over this property of the model, it will actually trigger a SQL query. So it's much more expensive. So this is how you do, how you sort of create doc types from the models. And then you only need a way to actually index those into Elasticsearch. You typically need two ways to do it. A batch job, so management command is the perfect place to do it. And you literally only need these four lines. Uh, you see the book dot in it, which will actually send the mapping into Elasticsearch and create it there. And then uh, there is a simple, uh, there is a simple uh, function called bulk from in the Elasticsearch client that just takes an iterator and it will actually uh, put this all into, into Elasticsearch. So you just iterate over all your models and put it in there. You need to have a batch job like this because you might need to re-index your data. Remember what I told you about the text analysis. It happens at index time. 
So if you change anything about your text analysis, you found out that uh, the analyzer that you chose doesn't work as well as you, uh, as you thought, or you realize that you needed to keep the raw version uh, too late, and you already have data in there, you need to re-index your data. So that is why it is important to have a very convenient way to do this. And then the second part of it is just listen to signals, and whenever a model changes, just replicate the change into Elasticsearch. And again, as you can see, it's five lines, including the imports. You can do very similar things for deletes. Just do instance.toSearch.delete and bind it to a post or pre-delete signals based on what your application requires. So again, this part is super simple. Some people actually uh, pr uh, prefer to do the update search uh, in the background somewhere, for example, using Celery or, or RQ or something, because it can be a potentially expensive process. Not because Elasticsearch is slow, but because the toSearch method actually does a lot of things. It fetches a lot of data from your, uh, from your primary database and puts them together into a single document. And that can potentially uh, be fairly expensive. And you might not want to pay that price whenever you uh, hit model.save. So again, depends on your application and what are your requirements. Do you need the .save to be quick? Or do you, need, uh, do you always require the Elasticsearch to be absolutely up to date? That's really what you have to answer for yourself and for your application. So the next part is how do you actually define a search? Note the, the little friendly warning star. This is, a, this is a fairly new feature that we're working on. And that is a solution for people who actually don't want to type in the search. They don't, they don't want to learn all the different types to query and they just want to throw something up there quickly yet still retain the option to uh, move on in the, uh, in the future. So this is a, f uh, this is a faceted search uh, subclass, and it's exactly that. It's just a, a sort of a declarative version of what we have been building throughout the talk. So I just say that I want to search over books and magazines. They live in the, uh, in the index called library, and I want to search through these fields. Notice that I can, I can give uh, multiple versions. I can even use wildcards here. And I want to use these facets. And I give it uh, an instance of, of the aggregation. And that's all I need to do. Uh, then I just use it from, uh, from the views. So I get the data together and know that this is a very, very bad idea to do it like this. You probably want to wrap it in a form or something because this would blow up if you give it an incorrect date. So it's purely for demonstration purposes, just a big disclaimer. Uh, but it actually works. Uh, all you need to do is instantiate, instantiate the search, execute it, and pass it on to the template. And note the name of the template. That's no accident. It's actually the same template that you use to render uh, your default list. So if you used, uh, I took this from an application where I use uh, the Django generic views, and I just use the list view. So I had to create a, a, a template called library slash book underscore list. And then when I implemented the search, I didn't really want to write another template. I really don't know anything about HTML, so writing one template was a, was a superhero thing for me. I didn't want to repeat that. So I just reused that. And because I maintained the shape of the document, the interface, the template just worked. I didn't have to cr uh, create a different template for the models and for the documents. There was only one difference. This view actually renders much, much faster. Because when I want to uh, render the comments, they're already there. If I want to render the author, he's already there. I don't need to do uh, I don't need to remember that I should uh, do, uh, fetch the related models or I don't need to make sure that uh, the person who is doing the template, in case it's not me, doesn't do anything crazy, like try to render every single comment or anything like that. All the data is already there. So you don't need to 
fetch the comment, uh, fetch uh, the individual models. You just render what you get back from the search. And if, you, if you're smart about it and you maintain the same shape, there is, there is no additional work. You just, this is all you need to implement and you have a working search. The only thing that you actually have to implement is some form or something to actually get the data. But that's, that's pretty much it. And in the future versions of this, uh, of this object, I hope to actually be able to give you a Django form to use. So this is how you actually implement search. It's not that much. And so just to, just to sort of wrap it up and, and uh, mention everything. So you have to think in documents not models. You have to collect all the, related, uh, all the related models, dump them all together into one big document. Don't be afraid, the document can be large, it can be complicated, it can have lists of objects and everything. It will still, it will still work just fine. Uh, you want to maintain the same shape for the models and for the document. In order to save yourself work, in order to avoid duplication of efforts for templates and for, for other parts, uh, if, you, uh, if you do it correctly, you can even reuse a lot of the forms. So you can actually manipulate directly uh, the, uh, uh, the, the doc types. And you don't have to go through the models. And finally, always have the two ways to put the data into Elasticsearch. You always need uh, the, uh, the batch uh, command, Management commands are perfect place for this, and uh, then have the signal handlers to actually keep things in sync once you have them indexed. And for that, you might want to consider using an asynchronous solution, uh, something like Celery or RQ. So that's the that's the core of it. So I have, I have the control question: Are you still afraid to search? Or have I managed to, who have I managed to convince that it's actually not that hard? Okay, a few people, I'm, I can be happy with that. Okay, so we still have a few minutes left, so I'll just run through the, uh, the bonus chapter, what else you can get from Elasticsearch if you've, if you've uh, gone so far as we've, uh, we've discussed. So the first thing that you can use in, on top of it is uh, some features that we call suggestors. And there are two types of suggestors in Elasticsearch. Uh, for, uh, first is a terms or a phrase suggestor, which is the did you mean functionality. Remember, we are the search guys, we understand the text. We have all, this, all the statistics on all the words. How common it is, in how many documents it is, how many times in each document, and all that. So if you give us a word and we don't find it, we can, f we can find you a, a one that's very close to it. And we can use the statistics that we keep on, the, on those words to tell you how likely it is that you've just mistyped. That it is fairly close to some word that we actually know about. This is not based on a dictionary. We don't actually uh, have all the words for English. We only have the words in your document. So that's the terms suggester. If you use the phrase one, it will even be context aware. So if you actually search for Ruby on rail, which is completely correct phrase, we will actually tell you that you probably actually meant Ruby on rails because that's actually much more common. So did you mean Ruby on rails? Well, you probably meant Django, but hey, mistypes happen. <laughs> and then the, uh, the next uh, type of suggestions that we have is the completion suggester. And that is the super fast suggest as you type one. It is literally as you type because we actually can keep the, the response time under a millisecond so you can literally fire it up after every keystroke. But there are some, there are some trade-offs. For example, you need to uh, manually tell us what are all the different variants of the input that we should autocomplete on. Uh, for example, if you're looking for uh, PyCon Australia, you might also want to autocomplete this when somebody starts typing uh, Australia first and then PyCon, or PyCon Brisbane, or something. So you give multiple different inputs and one canonical output. 
and you also want to give it a custom score. Because if you type a single letter, we will provide you with, uh, with a completion suggestion. But there is really no way we can do any sort of relevancy or anything like that based on a single letter. So we rely on you to rank the results, give importance to the individual document uh, based on popularity, based on how much they pay you, I th whatever. Uh, that, again, depends on your, on your application. So that's one additional feature that you can very easily add on top of, uh, on top of the search. There is a suggest method, just throw some data in there and it will work. Uh, the next one is my favorite because it doesn't require any coding whatsoever. You just install a tool called Kibana, which is essentially an interface to Elasticsearch. It's a JavaScript application that runs primarily in the browser, and it gives you nice graphs like these. So once you have indexed all your data into Elasticsearch, using your batch job and then keeping it in sync using the signal handlers, uh, you can get a nice overview of your data. Very easily, very fast. It again uses the aggregations framework, so you can see that you, you have multi-dimensional aggregations here. These, this is an example with logs from a web server. So here we, ha we, are, we have split the visitors by country that they came from. For each country, we split them first, whether they were logged in or not. And then for each of those subgroups, we, uh, we present you what browser they used, all in a single picture. And you can immediately see that there are different countries that have dramatically different behavior from their users. And you can see that immediately because you as humans are essentially a pattern recognition machines. Also, when you look at the timeline graph, you can immediately notice the, the dip there. You can see it, but for to make a computer see it, that would be fairly expensive and you would actually have to tell them what to look for. With humans, it's easy. You just look and you see. So that is why data visualizations are super useful. And that is why I really love, uh, love Kibana for this, because once you have the data in Elasticsearch, you can do all sorts of analytics on your data. For example, in, in, in the library, like what is the most borrowed book? Uh, what is the, uh, the book that people never return? It's probably in the how to commit suicide department. Um, and other different analytics that you, that you can run. So Kibana, just throw it in there. Uh, just, uh, you don't have to install anything. You can even run it locally on your machine. You just tell it how to connect to your Elasticsearch cluster. And this is what you get essentially for free. You need to click a little bit to actually create those visualizations. But that's all that is required. And the last feature that I'll mention, uh, because it's fairly, fairly interesting, is the percolator. So far, we've been running queries on documents. Percolator puts it a little bit upside down, and because we're in Australia, we need to make that happen. <laughs> so previously, we were indexing documents and running queries. Percolator, we index queries and then run documents. It answers the, the age-old question, which queries would have matched on this document? So it is very useful if you want to have the stored search functionality. A user does a, does a search on your website, and then they want to uh, say, hey, save this search and alert me when there are new, new documents that actually match. You get that for free. You can use it for classification. For example, it's fairly easy to craft a query that will only match documents in English because there are some words that only exist in English. And if a document uh, contains enough of those, you can say with a good confidence that that document is in English. And you can do the same for many other languages. So then when you show, show a document to a set of index queries like that, you will get back the list of queries that matched. In other words, you'll get back the information on which language this document is actually written in. So super simple. You can also do the same for geolocation. If you have, if you have a, a geo coordinates in your document, but you don't know where it is, you can very simply construct a query that will match all the points in Australia. So if you use that as a percolator, you, you show it a point and you'll get back the information, yeah, it's in Australia, it's in Queensland, it's in Brisbane. And you can sort of get back uh, all of that based on a geo point. And that's it for me. So if you have any questions, 
but of course Ross does. Just for that, I won't ask the question. Um. <laughs> Thanks, Anta. Um, you have shot a slide where you um, updated or, in or inserted the document into Elasticsearch. How do you keep track of documents that are already in there when you update them? Why or would I? Do, yeah. does it then, um, it's, it's the same API. You, you just call dot save, and just like with Django models, if it's there, it'll get updated. If it's not there, it'll get inserted. Okay, thanks. Sure. Thanks, Hansa. Um, a big, a big project that's been around Django for a long time is Haystack, and. I'm what? surprised it was the second <laughs> question and not the first one. I know, I thought I'd give it to you. I've already come up with a reason I'd do the same thing, search directly, but can you answer from the stage why you didn't suggest Haystack as part of that solution? Haystack is, uh, it was very good when it, when it came out and it made search a lot easier. Uh, the problem I have with Haystack or why I don't recommend or talk about it is it has a very low ceiling. It allows you to get from uh, 0 to 10 super quickly, and then you will never get past 10, or it will cost you an enormous amount of pain. It was, uh, it was defined to get you, uh, d designed to get you up and running uh, and deliver a simple search. But if you want to move past that, it really has no way. Also, it's a very generic tool that tries to cater to different search engines. It supports Woosh and Solar and Zapien and Elasticsearch. And, and others, and they are very different. So because Haystack wants to support them all, it had to uh, make a conscious decision to only support the common denominator. So actually 90% of the features that I presented here won't be available through Haystack. Aggregation, suggestors, percolators, uh, yeah. And even the queries that, that, are, that are run with Haystack are not as optimal. It also forces you into the idea that documents are flat, that you have a list of fields with values, nothing else. Uh, it's very difficult to have a list of nested objects with Haystack. So that is why I don't, I don't recommend it. Thanks. Okay. Um, I can tell a lie, I will ask a question. Um, variation on theme of things that you may not recommend. Obviously, iContains is, doesn't do the job. But Postgres does have uh, a text search index. So how far down that path does, does that compare with, with Elastic? Uh, so it can do, actually, it, it performs fairly well with, uh, with the full text part. It can do the analysis and it can do the queries. Uh, the problem is that it's still within, uh, within the database. So it's hard to actually uh, have different shape of the, uh, of the document to uh, perform all the all the joins and everything like there. It is a it is a fairly good solution if you have a very small website and you just want to have this one uh, one thing there. But it gets super uh, super expensive once you want to add something like facets, which are not simply possible. You would have to have a single query for each of the facets that you want to that you want to display, um, etc. So it is if you just want to. If you just want a super simple search, it's, it's definitely an option, especially if you don't want to invest into, uh, into running Elasticsearch, figuring out how to actually run uh, Java or how to actually type Elasticsearch enter on a command line. <laughs> uh, and then it's, it's an option. It's sort, of, uh, it's sort of the similar situation where uh, like SQLite versus Postgres. SQLite is fine, it works great, it's a, it's a great database. And if you can get away with using it, sure, go for it. But Postgres would, will give you so much more. So it's sort of a similar answer. All right. um, you just said that <coughs> Haystack only supports the thing that's common for all the search engines. And I understand you work with Elastic specifically, but would you have any input on what other engines exist and that may still be good? <laughs> just, just, no, so <laughs> <laughs> Are you trying to get me fired or? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, there are other search engines. Um, um, the most common, uh, common uh, one that people use is Solar. It's also built on Lucene, same as Elasticsearch, so it uses the same sort of uh, uh, engine that actually does, uh, does like the uh, inverted index and the text analysis stuff and everything. But uh, it's, it's, a little, it's a little older than Elasticsearch. 
uh, you actually have to write some, some XML for configuration and, and stuff like that. It's more Java-esque uh, than Elasticsearch. And uh, then there are others. I, I consider the others to be slightly inferior because of Lucene is just an amazing library that is that has the state of the art in in uh, uh, I, I forgot how this field is called. I'm sorry. Uh, information retrieval. It's a state of the art information retrieval library that's used by all of the all of the products, including like IBM Watson, the robot that won Jeopardy. Uh, it all uses Lucene under the covers. So Lucene is definitely where it's at, and then it's a choice between Solar and Elasticsearch. I typically recommend people spend five minutes with each, uh, see how far you can get with Elasticsearch, and see if you can get Solar running. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that was a little low blow, but. Uh, sorry, um, Elasticsearch, if I were to search for it without the name, what is it? Is it it's not a search engine, what, what is it? As it's a, a data store. It's, it's a, a distributed data store. data store. It's a fully clustered solution. So just start two of them on your machine. They'll find each other. They'll form a cluster. Uh, it, it can scale up uh, really high. We've seen uh, clusters with data approaching a, a petabyte. So it can scale really far. We've seen it running on a Raspberry Pi, so it scales really low. <laughs> Never ever do that, but it is possible. <laughs> so. Uh, that's the short answer, and I'm afraid we are running out of Thank time. You. Thank you. Very much. I will also have a talk on Sunday how you can use Elasticsearch to store logs into it. And in the meantime, if you ever see me around and you uh, have a question about Elasticsearch, you can ask me. And also, there is Joshua also from uh, from Elastic, and you can ask uh, ask him some questions uh, too. He is one of our support engineers, so he has all the answers <laughs> and all the patience. <laughs> so okay. thank you very much. Right. Thank you again, Hansa.